Good one. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, very pleased to see all of you at the Hans Beltic Library for the last uh, Středověk Inak of this uh, fall. As you know, this is the 10th anniversary of our meeting in, in public lectures. And so seeing this crowd for the last one of the year is particularly, I would say, amazing and the pleasure is even bigger because uh, we will have today an exceptional speaker uh, which is as you can see already Vincent Dubiez who is one of the I would say leading experts in the pre-modern visual culture with a focus on uh, the complex and sometimes ambiguous interaction between letters texts and images and uh, I would also say that Vincent is one of the most important French scholars who is going beyond the borders of France. And I would say this is something which is really important, especially for the Francophone milieu. I will not be speaking about his superb awards, such as the fact that he has been elected as a member at Princeton, at Stanford and other impressive places. Um, as you know, I don't like the too much academic laudatios because they are sometimes a bit embarrassing and the person should stay here by and hearing. So I would just say that Vincent is one of the most curious scholars I know. Um, he's capable to go really beyond what we can imagine. And he's actually one of the person who is really now launching the reflection about the so-called abstraction in the pre-modern visual cultures. And he's really densely thinking on questions such as ornamentum or other issues which we like as well. But the most important aspect in the Vincent, I would say, intellectual being is that he is an absolute fan of the beer. And uh, we get two beers this afternoon to have the proper motivation. and. Um, by beer, I don't intend drinking alcohol. I mean, I'm not advertising alcohol at all for the audience, which is online, not at all. But um, by beer, I intend what is the most precious in scholarship. That means real conversation, discussions and interactions. And uh, I would say there are only few scholars who are so curious to discuss and be together as Vincent is. So this is for me the, the, the most we can find in the intellectual world. So I'm so happy that we can welcome Vincent here, who would like to present us today his paper, you see, is entitled The Angel in the Square, but the subtitle is more relevant, Silence in Medieval Images. So the sound, the absence of sound will be the epicenter of his reflection. So we are happy that you are here, Vincent, with us, and I'm pretty honored by your presence. Thank you so much. So can I sit? Will you hear me if I sit? Yes, I guess I can. Okay. <laughs> I didn't wait for the answer. This is a very French way of asking questions, you know. <laughs> so, so thank you, Ivan. I know you don't like now the laudatio, but let me just do one, please. <laughs> uh, I would like first to thank uh, Adrian and you for making me come to Brno. It has been a long time since for the, we discussed this for the first time. But I'm really honored. The honor is mine. I'm pleased. And I want really to thank you, not only for this invitation, which is very personal, and, and uh, nobody cares if I'm grateful or not <laughs> in the end. But still, I think uh, I want just to express my uh, very uh, sincere admiration for what you have done here in Brno with the Center for Medieval Studies, which is just amazing for all of us. It's really an inspiration for many scholars across Europe for your creativity, your open-mindedness, your restlessness. <laughs> and and I, I guess you really managed to put a poetical approach to medieval art on the map. And this is probably one of the, your biggest achievements. And I, uh, I am grateful for that because it makes us all feel better. So I am really happy to be here. And I will uh, try to go today with this lecture that I will give in my very Frenchy English. And I hope it can be understandable. I wish I could do this lecture in check but it will not happen so it, it will be better for everyone so please forgive me if i have to read uh, more than i usually do but uh, i guess it will be better for for all of us so let's begin with this very strange title i hope that i will make the title uh, at least uh, as interesting as the subtitle when we will reach the end of this lecture in 45 minutes but i don't 
I don't want you to trust me right now. Let's see if you can trust me at the end of the lecture. So let's begin. In 1939, Spanish composer Joaquin Rodrigo wrote the full movement guitar concerto known as El Concierto de Aranjuez. Joaquin Rodrigo was blind since the age of three and developed for his artistic practice a complex system of braille notation for music, as you can see here. It's curious how the braille notation trying to reproduce by the movement of the dots and the lines matches the visual intensity of pneumatic notation used during the Middle Ages. The original score for the Concierto de Aranjuez is now kept in Madrid and it shows the intriguing display of tactile musical notes along on the paper. The completely silent object seems sculpted by music. Melodic movements exist only on the page as forms that can be translated into sound by the performer's fingertips as an action of his body over the instrument. Joaquin Rodrigo's beautiful score reveals the tension between artistic creation and the modality of its notation, something that Goodman already noted so many years ago, between the intangible process of composition and its visual transcription, between musical aesthetics and what remains of it in silence. This is a structural aspect of art history and our experience as spectators. It invites us to consider everything that escapes the realms of shapes. This is also the characteristic of medieval images, since they precisely concern notions as complex and fluid as sound and silence. On folio 60 of the Paris Psalter, painted at the beginning of the 13th century, the letter D of verse 2, Dixit custodiam vias meas, shows an image of King David pointing out his mouth toward the devil. This curious depiction echoes the content of the psalm in which David decided to remain silent not to sin, decided to remain silent to be able to praise God with dignity. David's gestures identifies the king's mouth as the place for both speech and silence and the image stages the ambiguity of a silent depiction in the core of the Book of Chants, creating a visual dialogue between silence and discourse, between content and context, between what is meant to be heard and what can actually be seen. In this lecture, I would like to share some of the insights of a long-term research project on the place and form of silence in medieval visual culture, focusing on the aspects of visibility and invisibility. Not to be too French, I have decided to divide this park in four parts and not three parts. And it will, you will see that it's just a trick, actually. I will first present the historiographical background of the topic and the medieval intellectual framework of the notion of silence. And in the remaining of the talk, I will focus on three case studies or cluster of images staging the idea of silence and its medieval properties. And in the conclusion, I will try to stress the ontological radicalism of these acts of images. The study of silence in the Middle Ages, of its representation in medieval images, and more generally of the intellectual and formal links between silence and visual arts is part of a global trend of humanities and social sciences, namely the sound or soundscape studies, an anthropology of sounds, noises and senses, despite of all the difficulty this topic can raise. Indeed, all the images of ancient, medieval and modern art are silent. With such an assumption, I mean that they are today resisting any kind of phenomenology of sounds. An image of music, speech or chant can certainly contain some sound, display its physical properties or visually stage its qualities, but it cannot produce by itself the sound. 
The figure of David in Charles the Bold's first Bible, for example, is not only an image of the king, but the representation of musical harmony. But this image, however explicit, is not a device of sound production. Despite of its dynamic and vibrant feature, the image of the apse of the church of Santa Olalia in Estaon in Catalonia, painted in the second half of the 12th century, is absolutely silent. It does not matter if it represents the song of the archangels and if the painted inscription reproduces their acclamation of the triple sanctus. Sound lies in the shape of the image, in the visual modalities of its design, as well as in its effect. Seeing the angels singing in Estaon means listening to the image of the sanctus. No hearing, therefore, but the imagination of a sound in the medieval sense of the word imaginare, to put it into image. Silence and the sound dimension of the images escape the sound experience to enter the visual discourse on its existence, whether graphic, chromatic, or positional. Exploring medieval images of silence, or more exactly, the presence of silence in medieval images, consists in considering silence as something, a positivity and a fullness. But what kind of silence are we talking about? As we all know, silence, peace, calm are important topics in the publishing industry today. And we should be very careful not to paste on medieval reality a light and commercial understanding of a notion which is actually deeply rooted in devotional and spiritual practices, but also in a comprehensive cosmology. Silence is more than something you can buy to acquire some kind of peace. The technology of unplugging yourself is so convenient that it becomes very futile. Silence in the Middle Ages is something that is much deeper than that, and I hope we can see that tonight. There is obviously a fundamental precedent for this, which can be found in the biblical tradition. Silence is continuously present in the biblical narrative, and divine revelation operates in signs, thunder, lightning, lights, roar, tremors, as well as in calm, stillness, and in the absence of sound. Silence in the Bible is associated with very different action, values, and circumstances. The silence in the temple, the silence of the witness, the silence of the victim, and the silence of heaven. And I want to share just two images of this silence. The first one is Christ writing on sound, as you know, and the gospel, that just Christ remains silent and writes on, um, on the sound something we don't know, but that the Middle Ages interpreted at the scenes of the adultery woman. Another very famous example is the, si is the silence of the building of the Temple of Solomon. Solomon comes and says that no hammering must be heard inside the temple in order not to change the harmony of the inner part of the temple. All are indication of a particular relationship with God between language and contemplation. The name of God himself, made of letters that cannot be pronounced, is an act of silence. Despite of this biblical tradition linking silence, creation and revelation, the concept of silence is not a central theme of reflection among the fathers of the church. It appears at the intersection of rhetorical practices and theological reflection on the relevance and limits of language within the knowledge of God. Saint Augustine, as usual, occupies a crucial place in the elaboration of Christian silence. Not immediately, of course, but because of his theology of language, which invites him to also consider the function and meaning of the absence of words. For Augustine, silence is what surrounds words and gives them their consistency, measure, and rhythm. 
Silence is, in its relation to language, a sign of the supremacy of the word, as staged in the famous vision of Ostia. In his reflections on meaning and function of music, he also develops a quantitative approach to silence. And this is a crucial point, because St. Augustine gives silence a form, a color, and an effect of aesthetic nature. And it's very striking that all the artists at the Black Mountain College in, um, in, the, way, in the East Coast of the United States in the 60s and the 70s already has perceived this dimension that St. Augustine tried to uh, stress from the silence. And this is something that will be constantly developed in contemporary art. And I give you only one example to show that. In the famous white painting of Rob Richard Rauschenberg, he said, according to Augustine, that silence is the subject and today is the author of the painting. And a direct link with um, the Augustinian theology of language. And I wish I could uh, find a publication on the library of Black Mountain College. I would love to see what kind of book they had in the 60s in this very college to see how those ideas reaches those artists. Rauschenberg, of course, but that's John Cage, obviously. The practices of monastic silence are placed throughout the Middle Ages in this Augustinian tradition of a silence that surrounds us. The monastery is a monumental image of this silence that surrounds the world. The silence of the monastic structure of this architectural and human organization guides the monk from the taciturnitas, it means the fact of speaking few, to silence, the fact of not speaking at all. The first monastic rules proposes a language discipline which image is the desert and which prohibits monks from speaking at specific times and places in the monastery. St. Benedict's insistence on qualifying the silence that can be alternately large, common, absolute, small. It is all the words that you can find in the rule of St. Benedict to qualify the silence shows that he first tries to prevent messy, uncontrolled and potentially dangerous language by the use of silence. At the service of the prayer and permanent praise, silence is an instrument of the internal discipline of the religious men and women. As such a conception of silence will not be discussed before the middle of the 12th century, but other communities, however, and this is the case of the Carthusian monk, for example, keep recommending an absolute silence in search for a permanent peace of the soul able to make audible the truth and permanence of God's presence. As we see, and this is why silence is such a difficult notion to approach within the sound studies, silence in the Middle Ages is both a discipline with empirical properties and social impact, and the theological elaboration where silence is first a sign for the encounter with God. And this is what medieval images represent. And obviously, this Fra Angelico's painting, which is kind of, of a cliche for all the images of silence, shows this tension between these two aspects because it's located in the hallway in a um, um, Dominican convent. So it can be linked to the discipline of silence. But this is also a painting of St. Peter Martyr, which means that it's also the silence of the martyrdom. So what can be quite obvious in the gestures, and we will see that, as usual, gestures in the Middle Ages are never obvious. It's always more complicated because you can feel this tension between something that is kind of a rule or a norm or something that you should follow and something that is deeper than that, that it's a quality of the state of the human being. The first images of silence I would like to explore shape a coherent corpus of explicit figurations. They represent the silence of half an hour after the opening of the seventh seal of the book held by the Lamb in the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 1. And when he opened the seventh seal, 
there followed a silence in heaven in a space of half an hour. For Ambrosius Opter, abbot of San Vincenzo Avolturno, who died in 784, the silence of Revelation 8.1 is the sign of heaven as, and I quote, the church of the righteous men from which any form of tumult have been banished, end of quote. His ideas reflect the Augustinian interpretation that I mentioned earlier, and I quote, silence represents the soul that listens. The tumult represents the oscillating body. Saint Augustine also writes, silence of heaven is the silence of divine contemplation, end of quote. Opposing body and soul, Emo of Auxerre, monk of the Benedictine, Benedictine Abbey of uh, Saint-Germain, who died around 878, describes silence, and I quote, as a sign of God's contemplation. What was done until then in the tumult of the search is now done in the stillness of the revelation, end of quote. And Bruno of Ceni, abbot of Monte Cassino, who died in 1123, writes, and I quote, after the opening of the seventh seal, there is no longer any need to speak. What was seen until then by the reflection of the language is now seen face to face. End of quote. In at least eight copies of the commentary on the Apocalypse written in the 8th century in the north of Spain by Beatus, a monk of the Abbey of Liebana, and illuminating from the 8th to the 13th century, non-narrative or non-figurative images are painted close to this verse and its exegesis to represent the silence in heaven. Beatus' commentary is part of an exegetical tradition dating from the 6th century. It partially compiles such a tradition, although at the same time it shows some originality about the relevance of the apocalypse message. What is described in the John's vision is already underway in history. It is not a timeless event. In his commentary about Revelation 8.1, Beatus insists on the fact that silence is a moment of vision, a place of sight. He strongly links the absence of sound with the revelation and transforms the possible emptiness of this moment into the fulfillment of faith. And this is exactly what the images in the manuscript of the Beatus Commentary represent. If we want to describe these images in a generic way, we could say that silence is represented by a parchment ira, an ira separated from the rest of the folio by the frame. The presence of the frame suggests the appearance of a shape on the parchment as silence appears in the sky. The shape is geometric. It obeys an articulated, measured, mechanical construction. The so programmed space or area is thus full of order. In addition, most of these figures follow a modular pattern, a pattern governed by strict arithmetical and so musical proportion, two thirds, three fourths, ninth eleventh. And I will focus here only in two examples. I knew you loved that. You love that. In the Silos Beatus, painted and copied around 1100, silence adopts the shapes of a rectangle drawn in black and painted plain yellow, a field of light opening in the page. Gold is spreading in the frame in the same way that heavens opens in John's vision. And this is what the scribe meant to represent in the manuscript. Here, silence is color and nothing but color. Just a visual feature staging the lack of sound. Let's have a look at the richest composition painting in the Navarra Beatus in the 12th century. On a background made of oblique, wavy, alternately blue and brown stripes, stands a stilling of white stars. In this open sky are painting four busts with both fingers on the mouth. And this is the only image explicitly pointing at the mouth in the Corpus of Beatus manuscript. This image shows silence as it can be seen on earth. Silence as it can be seen on earth. 
The dialectic seeing, hearing is emphasized by the simultaneity of gestures and sight. The image is constructed so that it tells us that the vision is about silence, that seeing it's hearing silence. In these images, a lot of visual devices are used, combined, and overlaid to display the visible quality of silence. Geometry, matter, color, vegetal, lettering, narration. In accordance with the exegesis, images do not show emptiness or nothingness. On the contrary, they exalt what is already beyond silence, the page, the skin, the sky, to show that silence is everywhere. This dual conception of silence, both latent and active, omnipresent and unreachable, is what raises from the analysis of medieval images. And not only from medieval images, when it's main that silence is something that you can see. This year, Mark Taylor wrote this very strange and beautiful book called Seeing Silence, where he uh, analyzes the works of art of seven contemporary artists dealing with silence, whether in land art, sculpture, painting, and architecture. And what we can see is that the mean that are used in the Beatus images, geometry, matter, color, ornament, lettering, narration, did not change from this 8th century onwards. The gestures we just saw on the figure in the Navarra Beatus does not surprise us, and especially who, who here tonight have kids. If you want your kids to be quiet, you will do the exact gest same gestures, and if you don't, you are a liar. Um, because this is the gesture we will find in the most frequent images of silence in the Middle Ages. In the scene representing Zechariah's mutism according to the Gospel of Luke, as we see it on the west wall of the baptistry on San Mark Basilica in Venice, the mosaics around the middle of the 14th century. The gestures is very precise. The index seems to touch Zechariah's sealed lips. And it can already be found in the paintings of the northern apse of Santa Sophia Church in Benevento in the 8th century. As in Venice, Zechariah tries to engage in conversation with a group of faithful outside the temple. His finger points his seal of the lips. In the famous Pericops of Henry II from the early 11th century, the fingers on the mouth is staged in the heart of the same prevented interaction between characters. We find the same layout in the complex contemporary composition in folio 111 of Bernard of Hildesheim, Gospels. Zechariah seems to cover his mouth with all with hand, or later in the 14th century bronze door of the baptistry of Florence. The veil of silence stretched above the city in the image of Venice, however, shows that less obvious devices may have sometimes been displayed. According to Luke's narrative, the meeting of the angel and Zechariah takes place inside the temple, near the altar, in the intimacy of the sanctuary, where Old Testament requires the institution of a total silence. Liturgical installation on or around the altar in most images reinforced the sanctuary privacy and secluded spaces through the presence of a baldachin, as in Venice, or through fencing devices, chancel, door, curtains, wall, veil. This is what we can see, for example, in the painting of the Huntingfield Psalter, painting in the early 13th century. There is no veil, no liturgical structure, no finger gesture in this picture, nothing at first to indicate the silence of the temple and Zachariah mutism. In the central panel of the painting, however, one sees Zachariah's features set within a pink border painted with white stars and circles. I would argue that this border in the center of the image stages the fence of silence surrounding Zachariah. 
In Bervard of Hildesheim Gospel, fencing devices play an important visual and functional role in both registers. Their variation underlines the difference between two places, the Annunciation in the sanctuary and the encounter with the people in the city. In the first scene, the fence is a parapet opened by arches standing on columns with capitals. In the second scene, we see a solid wall with no opening and which continuity is reinforced by the checkboard pattern. The switch from opening to closing could, in this image, stage Zechariah's silence. The angel's voice can move freely from heaven to earth and act as a link between the two worlds, while Zechariah's voice is sentenced to prison after the angel's punishment. Medieval exegesis has traditionally interpreted the silence imposed to Zachariah as a punishment from his disbelief or doubt. A sermon of St. Augustine emphasizes, for example, the role of the angel in removing Zachariah's voice, as we can see in St. Anbon Psalter, painted in the second quarter of the 12th century. The figures are placed on each side of the altar under the baldachin, and the angel leans over the table to touch Zachariah's mouth and make him temporarily silent. The redundancy of verse 20 in the Gospel of Luke, ecce eris taquet, and not poteris loqui, mm, shows that the complexity of the silence imposed on Zachariah. It does not only mean being unable to speak, but being unable to communicate the content of his vision. He cannot testify and act as a prophet, announcing his son's birth. Thus, the insistence of medieval images in pointing out Zechariah's mouth is not trivial nor practical. It is about describing visually a specific quality of the voice, ides, the priestly and prophetic voice. Zechariah's silence underlies two medieval modalities of the notion. During the Annunciation, silence first concerns the temple and sacrificial action on the altar. The angel appears and fills the moment and place with the voice he receives from God. Silence is then considered as a quality or modality of speech. Words and voices can be silent depending on their audience or their content, whether prophetical, miraculous, or sacramental. The liturgical silence emanating from the images of Annunciation to Zachariah raises from the visual conjunction of the monumental context of the encounter between the angel and the priest around the altar on the one hand, and the silence imposed on Zachariah on the other hand. The censor activated by Zachariah is often accompanied by other objects on or around the altar, which transform the temple ceremony into an anticipation of the Eucharistic sacrifice. The altar is a Christian altar, covered with a tablecloth and carrying a chalice, a pattern, etc. These images thus tend to fold time and to transform Zechariah into an image of the priest acting in the church during the Christian liturgy, which actually incorporates rich's practices of silence. William Durand in the Rationale Divinorum Officiorum the monumental exegetical synthesis of the gestures, words, and objects of the liturgy compiled in the 1280s establishes three types of silence. The silence of ignorance, the silence of despair, and the silence of glory. The Rationale uses three slightly different expressions to evoke these liturgical silence. The first expression, cum silentio is used to describe action or movement performed without uttering the words of the ritual or without the occupiment of ch or chants. The second expression is in silentio, is used to describe the attitude of the listener remaining silent during the readings or the recitation of liturgical formulas. You are in silentio. The third expression, sub silentio, is the most frequently used and paradoxically describes the words and formula pronounced under the silence. If the first two expressions actually mean an absent voice 
or an unpronounced sound. The last expression, sub silencio, refers to a specific quality of the voice. For that reason, the expression sub silentio is particularly used in chapter 35 of the fourth book of the Rationale, dedicated to the examination of the secreta. Dicitur etiam secreta, quia secrete et sub silentio dicitur. William Duran refers with this expression to the prayer pronounced silently by the priest when facing alone the altar, he prepares himself to perform Christ's gestures and words. According to William Duran, those words have to be pronounced in silence, but they have to be pronounced because Christ prayed alone in the garden before the crucifixion. Repeating Jesus' retreat, the priest must, and I quote William Durant, enter the room of his heart, close the senses of his body, pray the Father with the claim of his heart and not his voice. End of quote. The secretary is thus an entanglement of silence and speech at the moment of the Eucharistic transformation. It is a time of preparation both for the priest and the faithful who are summoned to lock them in to celebrate the mystery of the Eucharist. To my knowledge, there are very few images combining the depiction of liturgical action and a clear indication of silence. This is the case yet in one of the paintings of the famous Utah Codex, copied and illuminated in Regensburg in the early 11th century, on a folio presenting a gold-saturated composition of incredible iconographic and theological richness with St. Erad of Regensburg celebrating the Eucharist. On the bottom right corner, a figure with the right index on the lips is labeled rigor discretionis. Because this lectionary was intended to Niedermünster Abbey, ruled by Abbess Jutta, the three angular virtues can match the monastic requirements of nuns called to live with discretion and pity and to practice this commandment with rigor and application. The figure on the lips gestures at the moment of the consecration in the image of the Mass of Saint Era is certainly a recommendation for the nuns, but it is also the sign of a liturgy which operates in the rigor of discretion in order precisely to preserve its mystery and transcendence. With the images staging Zechariah's mutism and liturgical silence, I wanted to show how medieval art uses bodily attitude, gestures, and movement to represent silence within the church. By focusing on the mouth, lips, fingers, and eyes, they propose a switch in the senses to emphasize the fact that hearing is not enough to understand what is happening in the images. Simultaneously, the analysis of the liturgical prescription of the secreta shows that silence refers to a specific quality of the voice, to words pronounced in silence, spoken in the secret of the heart. Images of silence are thus ambiguous because the medieval definition of silence resists, as usual, a binary reading, silence versus sound. Throughout liturgical manifestation, it becomes obvious that silence is a way to reach an experience of an inner vision of God. It escapes by definition the limits of language and unfolds beyond words. Bodies, senses, and words are set in motion to trigger the praise, but the encounter with God is not physical nor spoken. St. Augustine closes his City of God, stating that, and it's interesting that it's, this is the last sentence of the City of God after many, 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 many words. But St. Augustine said, at the end of times, there will, not be, there will be no need for speaking. Singing with the angel will be enough. The final and pure encounter with God is all about light and his bright and glorious presence inside. Most images of the ultimate theophany at the end of time so show musicians, cantors, singers, and seems to stage the jubilatio described by Augustine. And this is the case, for example, of the concert sculpted on the tympanum of the Abbey Church of St. Peter in Moissac, 
where the revelation of Christ in his glory is crushed by the presence of 24 musicians and elders from Revelation 5, 8, holding, and I quote, a harp and golden goblet full of perfume. Everything seems to indicate in the sculpture a very rich musical performance. The multiplication of instruments, their varied position in the hands of the elders, the phylactery aid by the angels, make a sonorous presence emerge from the composition. And according to the book of Revelation, the acclamation mingling music and voices from myriad of angels. However, in the great image of Moissac, the acclamation seems to move from the musical instruments and voices towards the elders' faces and eyes. Angel and musician set their body in motion and twist to turn their faces toward the center of the tympanum. This contortion produces the effect, at least visually, of an almost liturgical interruption of music and praise. I do not want to go too far and argue that seeing the theophany in Moissac withdraws the sonorous dimension of the sculpture. But I would like to suggest that if the image produces no sound, it is not because it is made of stone, but because it shows precisely the stupor triggered by the theophany, an abrupt halt in acclamation produced by the shock of the visual. Latin word stupor is frequently used in medieval text to describe the subsequent violent reaction after sight. Saint Augustine described the stupor admirationis, that it's the faithful reaching heaven and contemplating the assembly of saints. Saint Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus proposes a complex articulation between the companion's amazement who hear the voice but do not see. Stupefacti, they cannot tell what they experience. They first lose their sight and after that their voice. The shock of the vision is so powerful that it blinds Paul and make its companion silent. And the image of the second coming in Moissac could simultaneously be musical and silent, fixing in stone the gestures, attitude, and effects of the stupor admiration. Once again, the concept of stupor shows that a strict opposition, sound silence, is reductive for the correct understanding of medieval images. In fact, one should consider the sonorous and visual possibility of what I call the interstitial qualities such as resonance, holding, or suspension. In the same way as the, musician, the musical note persists in the resonance once it has been produced as a wave vibrating in the hair of the church, one should consider that silence one in style by liturgical norms or visual stupor persists in this environment. Sound and silent will thus have the ability to overlap and the images to simultaneously show the voice and its suspension, music and its disappearance. And I guess this is the main accomplishment of Bissera Penceval experiments in Hagia Sophia when you can hear both the voice and the voice fading away. And this is what, Ivan, you try to uh, establish for Kunk, obviously. Let's focus on a curious image painted in the section on Secreta, in the French translation of William Durand Rationale. The rubric above the image indicates that it shows the part of the mass done silently. In the image, a priest faces the altar on which we see a covered chalice. He joins his hand on his chest, he bows his head and closes his eyes in an attitude of profound meditation. His head is surrounded by five small figures of angels on his shoulders leaning toward his ears. In the upper left corner of the image over the altar, God looks at the priests and the angel points out his left ear with his right index finger. The image is located in the manuscript between the word silence in the rubric and the text giving the modality of the recitation of the secreta. The priest closed lips and his seclusion figures undoubtedly a contention of speech. Nothing sonorous happens in the image. 
Nonetheless, the angel's position and God's gestures indicate an exchange between the liturgical moment and heaven, as visually staged by the chromatic match between God's background and the color of the angel's halo. If the priest's closed lips do not spread any words nor sound, the words he pronounces in the room of his heart, the place he enters alone entering the liturgical moment in persona Christi, can be heard by God and by God only, as if they were pronounced by angels. This beautiful image leads our path towards the figure of the angel and toward his capacity to act and praise sub silentio. Here we have a paradox to solve. Angels are primarily the creature chanting hymns and leading with his voice the faithful prayer and thanksgiving. This is what can be read in many Old Testament verses and also in the book of Revelation. Angels from God's choir, vivid image of the celestial harmony, in tune with God's glory. But the corporeal conception of the angelic figure, this body which is not a body, defies the capacity of angels to sing, speak, and communicate. The entire medieval science of angel attests to these debates first about the angel's hypothetical need to use their voice, and second, about the eventual property of such a bodiless voice. The angel's voice close to God is thus an inexpressive speech, unreachable for men's ear, and that God only can hear as we saw in the image of the sacred. Angels have a voice, but it contains no word nor sound, only the pure wisdom of God. Such a noetic knowledge induces principle of communication beyond communication, because they are indeed unnecessary. Medieval theology will thus substitute the idea of an inexpressive voice by the idea of an angelic silence due to the angel proximity to God. John Scottis, in his commentary on Sergio Dionysius, states, and I quote, angels are herald of divine silence. However, angelic silence does not mean a complete deprivation of speech. On the contrary, the angel's silence consists of an articulate, articulated language, a perfect voice able to proclaim everything about God without using negation and without being limited by the imperfection of language. How did medieval image solve the paradox of the angel musician of silence? The property of angels' voices induce that one does not have to represent a singing angel to represent chants or praise, unlike a cantor or a choir. It is enough to figure the angel as an angel, silent praise in his entire body presence and beyond his voice. The monumental figures of Seraphim and Cherubim in poem B4 of Rabanus Marus de Laudibus Sante Crucis stage emphatic celestial bodies praising and singing only through their own presence. This poem is all about position and location, movement and gestures. Exaltation, praise and proclamation belong to the body language. And reading the prose poem in front, copied in front of this folio, it becomes obvious that the angel, and I quote Rabanus Marus, is a figura, a banner, a silent banner of singing praise. And both texts evoke the liturgical chant sanctus, but not as an effective sung voice, but as a silence embodied praise in style by the presence of angels around the cross. In the perspective of such a silent praise, we should have a new understanding of the images figuring around the theophany, cohorts of angels bearing empty phylacteries I you can see in this painting of the book of Revelation copied and illuminated in Flanders in 1313. In the upper registers, angels glorify the Magistas Domini. They carry empty phylactery, but stretch their hands and wings in sign of praise. They have the same postures as the elders in the lower register glorifying the Lamb, who do not carry phylacteries. 
According to the biblical text, both choirs, the angels and the elders, sing praising and rejoicing chants to the theophany. The empty phylactery carried by the angels is the evidence of a different praise, having different quality, a silent chant. The use of empty phylacteries has generally been interpreted as a figuration par défaut, as a sign for speech and not as a sign for silence. In the case of angel, this device should be read as such, as a sign of a silent speech, but also as the sign of a special relationship between God and the angels, so deep that it does not need articulation to produce a direct and harmonic content. Representing silence through the figure of an angel is subtle. Here we cannot look for explicit, ev explicit evidences, the finger on the mouth, a veil on the face, the lack of inscription, for an impossible or controlled speech, because this is not what silence means for the Middle Ages. We rather have to look among the visual devices for what can signify a differentiated speech or voice, a voice that, according to Augustine, renounces to text. Angelic chants during liturgy, especially the sequence and tropes, are described as a jubilatio. The core is invited to join, to join the angelic voices in the jubilatio and thus to transform human voices into angelic praises. This type of poetic elaboration is described by Amarius of Meth as a jubilus, and I quote, the verse for the Alleluia touches the counter deep in his feeling. So he only has in mind the reason why he is praising the, world, the Lord and why he should rejoice. These chains of praise named by the counter sequentia lead us to the state of mind in which there is no need for us to express words in which the soul reveals by itself that feels it, only through thoughts, only through silence. Even if pronounced in the liturgical performance as a chant, the sequence is not made of words. This is the expression of an inner feeling directly connected to God, and this is the reason why it adopts the luminous quality of the angelic speech. What is heard in the church during the singing transforms in its ascension to heaven. It loses its sonorous property and takes a light aspect. Singing with the angels does not mean only to join the ang angelic choir with one's human voice, but to adopt the silent and luminous quality of the angel speech. Silence in the end, in the Christian perspective, is nothing but an inner experience of light and peace. The figure of the angel confirms in that sense that silence has few to do with the bodily manifestation of a constrained speech. Exaltation and jubilation expresses in the chants and music belong to silence. And this is exactly the description of the Church of Life by Tadao Hando, built in Japan very recently. As I hope we have seen, the phenomenon of silence is incredibly dense in the Christian spirituality. Ezekiasm, voluntary confinement, ascetism, contemplation, and silent prayer are the radical means of deprivation of language, both purifying and edifying. Silence is rather an alternative modality of the sonorous encounter with God, placed under the prophylactic veil of restraint, humility, and discretion. However, the regulation of silence, accentuated or simply mentioned in certain circumstances, does not prevent its permanent existence. As the primordial state of the world, silence is a latency in creation, interrupted, covered, or concealed under a state of speech defined social practices to the same extent. Medieval images figuring silence visually translate the tentacular definition of the notion a definition that moves and reshapes during the Middle Ages. The ineffectiveness and latency defining silence and speech make them inaccessible to a strictly iconographic approach, insofar as they escape a sign to term translation. And this is what happened actually for most of the complex theological notion in the Middle Ages. To sum up the different graphic modality conveyed to represent silence in medieval visual culture, three main elements can be listed. The first one relates to the use of patterns and composition also used to display sounds, music, and voices in images. Silence is thus a wave, an opening, 
a tear, an alteration of the surface or environment of the figure. As musical sound, these devices obey a system of geometric and mathematical proportion, translating into the visual the harmony and euphony of silence. The second element concerns the use of patterns staging a connection between heaven and earth, beginning with the a figure of angels, vector of a silent world in the world of man. Alone or in cohort, carrying a phylactery or a musical instrument, the angel possesses a voice of another nature's always located beyond the constraints of language. And the third way of representing silence is using the vehicle of the body, whether with the figuration of a gesture, an attribute, or an interpersonal relation. Body shows both exchange words in the case of a dialogue and absent words in the case of silence. There is a regulation of postures and gestures in a silence choreography, a liturgical choreography in the figure of the priest, a divine choreography in the figure of Christ, on the Mount of Olives or in front of the adulterous woman, or community choreography in the occupation of the cloister by monks or nuns. The diversity of usual means allow a very wide range of type of representation, from obviousness and explicit in the case of the images from the commentary on the Apocalypse by Beatrice of Leviana, to the poetic allusion of light in some images of heaven. The elusive notion of silence operates in its visual translation by evocation, that is, by revealing the visual presence of, entity and of entities already contained in the image. At the end of this talk, this is what I would like to argue. There is no mystification of medieval visuality in acknowledging the poetic radicalism of these images. Such radicalism, well too often sees as an exclusive feature of modernity, is an essential posture in medieval creativity. And to transform a jubilant choir of angel into a concert produced in silence, as some images of the late Middle Ages do, placing them at the poetic crossroad of all doctrinal or theological elaboration about the angel's voice and its relation to silence, is indeed a radical creative gesture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Vincent. Uh, this was a splendid experience. I hope we will not assist to silence right now. Um, I am absolutely amazed by many things you've said, and uh, I have also a few questions, but I, I would like really to open discussion first to the audience. So if there are any observations, remarks, questions, or doubt, I mean, some of you are advanced scholars, other are students of the first year. So I believe all questions are accepted as well as the questions from the, let's say, virtual audience. And uh, it's just too important to say that if you write any questions to us right now, they will arrive in like two minutes. So you should do it right now if you wish to have an answer in a reasonable time frame. So are there any questions or remarks on the first ground? Yes, Adrian, please. But you need, I think, to, to use the mic, right? To be. Thank you very much for this great talk. I, I found it fascinating also to use uh, graphically, you know, how to represent silence. And uh, it made me think also about punctuation, the use of punctuation, the use of this also in modern literature and so on. But this is not at all my question. My question is more a complete curiosity, and I think it's maybe a bit stupid perhaps, but it is about the, the biblical narration. When in the Bible is the first silence broken? Because I don't recall in the Genesis, for example, when the first silence is broken. And we tend to imagine the creation perhaps as a very loud event, but how should we imagine the creation? As a very loud or as a very quiet event? And should we imagine the first silence being broken also by the, the original sin? Or how is, let's say, this? this because I, I was really wondering, I cannot recall all the biblical texts like this, but I was really wondering if this is something which is thematized by any authors and by any medieval thinkers, perhaps? Thank you. Actually, I, I, I like your first question, which is not a question more than the second one. So, so actually, I will answer the first one, that it was not a question. Uh, I, no, just, just, to, just to acknowledge the wonderful work by um, 
a French scholar who died um, three or four, four years ago, I guess, which is, who is Ma Anne-Marie Christin, who has a wonderful book, which is called La Poétique du Blanc, the poetry of, of, of blank, and, uh, and she deals really with uh, the relation between punctuation, spaces between words, and how it's been staged on the pages. Uh, so for your second question that I like less, um, I, I would like to stress that there is a real debate during the entire Middle Ages concerning the modality of creation and what we should understand between the word fiat. Uh, because some authors consider that this is an act of language other authors consider that it's uh, uh, just a will, that it's translated by the word fiat with no uses of words behind that. So this is a real medieval debate where to know whether the creation act is an act of language. And if it is an act of language, which seems obvious because this is the word is creating the world, but whether it is an articulated word or an act of willingness. So this is a real debate during all the Middle Ages. And, and, and the question you, you ask uh, has been asked during, uh, I would say that the Carolingian moment is very important here because this is the connection between the, uh, uh, the uh, Jewish exegesis and the uh, monastic uh, exegesis when uh, these themes are really discussed and debated. And after that, these debates will reappear with the nom nominalism, obviously, because um, should a thing have a word to exist or not, it's really linked to this question. So I would say that this is the moment when we have to consider whether the seal, the primordial silence is broken or not, according to this conception of creation, being an act of language or being a, an act of willingness. Thank you very much for providing us with really, let's say, rich and substantial food to intellectual food to digest over the, the evening. Uh, I was really amazed to see how uh, silence was materialized in the sense of the visual act uh, changed into an object to be listened to, to be heard and to be seen. And um, as far as I, if I got it right, like you uh, focus predominantly on the, let's say, theological ontological, visual, and perhaps epistemological uh, role of science, um, silence in the Middle Ages. And I'd like to ask, because what came to my mind was uh, obviously Horace and his Ars Poetica, like a classical uh, ancient author, one of the first uh, theorists of poetry, let's say. He uses silence um, as an aesthetic category, I would say, as a tertium comparationis between, on the other hand, image and text, because he says that uh, actual image uh, is um, silent text, whereas text is a speaking image. So I'm just uh, curious whether this concept was anyhow developed during the Middle Ages and whether silence was also used uh, in the sense of this uh, like purely aesthetic category as something to be com to, to compare the two media, let's say, the two, uh, uh, the two um, means of representation of reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. Um, Actually, this research has been published with a, a subtitle, <laughs> which is, uh, which is uh, Theology and Liturgy of Silence in the Middle Ages. So uh, my primary focus was on, let's see, religious themes, uh, because I guess that silence here can be really considered as a theological object. That's how I like to to put it, it means that something that acquires a specific quality in the discussion within the theological world. So, uh, so that was my concern. It doesn't mean that it does not exist outside of the theology, 
and you are writing, pointing out uh, the Arte Poetica, because we have the same in the Middle Ages. It is something that also appears in the treatise on poetry and uh, also in the treatise of grammar and so on, the treatise of music, th that we can find that in a uh, theoretical uh, elaboration and technically taking out everything from the, uh, from the uh, classical rhetorica that is available. So we will find uh, many uh, classical authors, especially as they have been reinterpreted by the late antique uh, grammarian. So that's very interesting that the late antique grammar treatises are making the bridge between uh, what uh, we, we would find at Artes Poetiques from the Middle Ages and the classical one. And we could also have focused on non-religious images because silence also exists uh, in, for, exam for example, in uh, medieval justice. For example, the witness uh, that refuses to speak, that remains silent, is guilty uh, by itself. And we have also that um, uh, in the Amour Courtois, silence is really a trope that uh, I'm so in love that I cannot speak. So we can find out. But the thing is that there are very few images of that. And it has been very uh, poorly translated into images. That was my concern. So uh, I, I, I guess that the idea of having a theological object is also reinforced by the fact that this is what has been translated into images. And because the silence in justice or silence in the Amokoto is not uh, 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 really uh, uh, an issue of this kind of elaboration, it does not appear in images. So, and this is something that could probably be extended. I don't know what you think, Ivan, about that, but that images are really a mean to elaborate on concepts too. And that's very interesting how here we can see that it has been a way of thinking about it. Uh, the, the, the images is always a, a question asked to the concept itself. And, and here I, I think it's, a, it's something that is important. For Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Yes. Th thank you so much. No, I, I, there, the, there were really many points. I, I will start with two observations. One very banal. And this is also a banal question in a sense, but uh, the, the, the gesture of touching the mount is something we know, I mean, all the longer pre-modern cultures, let's say like that. But now I've realized something I've never, I've never really thought about, is that one of the most ancient images we know uh, of monumental, let's say, representation, uh, the disappear today image of Santa Andrea and Santa Barbara in Rome is an apse with a Christ in the middle between four apostles. And uh, one of the apostles is doing this. And this gesture will then follow old Roman monumental visual culture up to the at least 12th century. So the gesture of touching the mount is actually present in a liturgical space, the one of the apse, with uh, the apostle who is assisting to the epiphany of Christ being touching his mount. And what is funny is that the other one is touching the heart. And I was always thinking these are only images of, let's say, movement, late antique dynamic. But now I'm, I'm just wondering whether this cannot be seen as the beginning of a reflection about the stupor and the silence in front of the godly presence. And this is making much more medieval the late antique visual culture, because it's actually opening to the, 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 in this direction. So this is one aspect, and the second, ob obviously, is not a provocation, but we know Vincent as uh, the man using the complex notion of abstraction, so I can't resist to, 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 to discuss the Beatus issue, right? So the, the, the white square on the white background, or yellow square on, on, on white background, um, apart the Malevich reference, obviously, is something which is impressive to me in, in, in the really mental space of re-abolition of the concept, because just the space of silence would be something which can be almost musical, right? You don't have notes, that means that the, the, the core is silent. But the fact that you are closing the silence using the, 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 the let's say, the, the Jerusalem image and the decision of putting yellow or white on it seems to me really interesting in the idea of, of using the absence, making it presence, because 
the white and the yellow are presences. So I would like to ask you to elaborate a bit on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, uh, and thank you for, for the link with the apostles. You, you know, this is the image we also have in uh, the wall paintings in Tarasa the, that have been uh, studied by Carlos Mancho. And, and he, he really uh, focuses on the gesture uh, and he uh, interprets it as uh, a late antique uh, image that has been staging at the paintings of the very early 8th century. So the link is quite clear. Uh, I'd, for, for Terrassa that we, we, we keep so we can make a, a, a quite uh, detailed analysis, uh, I have never thought about it in terms of stupor. Uh, um, and the gesture, the, 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 the paintings are very damaged, so we cannot see whether it's a gesture of the hand just in front of the mouth or this is pointing the lips. And so, because we cannot really identify the gesture, I would not have an interpretation, but I will definitely add this image that you're pointing out to that. Because uh, there is a link between the reaction to the revelation or to the epiphany and the fact of being of remaining silence in front of the amazement of that. But this is something that, as you know better than me, that the texts are not really discussing the, 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 the notion of amazement, of amazing. This is something that now is really uh, in the, in the, in the uh, historiography, but that I think those images have not been looked uh, in this perspective. But I, I think you, this is a really good path to follow. And yeah, for the Beatus, what is interesting is to look at these images with a careful reading of Beatus Glossa to the verse. And he used a word which is very interesting because in the entire commentary it is only used for geographical spaces, which is called pars. Mm -hmm. And so what you see in the sky is the pars silenti. It means a part of the silence, as if the half an hour was just a part of something it, that is meant to become bigger that you can see in its entirety. And I think that what w these images are discussing here is the relation between the part and the wall. And this is why you have this border and you have those spaces opening on something. Else. And Francisco Prado Villar in the study of these images is really focusing on silence as a space uh, and also as a natural space that he puts in relation with the part of the Leonese mountain in Spain. But here, I guess, what we can see uh, is uh, a, a will to show by the image something that you cannot reach, not because it's unreachable, but beca because it is not complete yet. So it's, a, it's something that is still a part of it, so that's why you need to frame this space, because it's a part of it. It's not the entirety. So, uh, and, and it's really what sits inside the glossa from Beatus. This is that something that has still to be revealed, that it's not here yet. So that's why you have to frame it in a way. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. I, I, well, you spoke a lot about the silence as about the absence of the sound of voices and what I would like to ask is the other sounds I, is there in the images or in the text you have seen you have read something about the absence of the other sounds like for example I don't know craftsman sounds or wind animal sounds just, just any other sounds which are not really produced by humans or I don't know, bells of the church, I don't know, just any other kind of sounds which are present in that world? Is it depicted or imagined somehow? Well, I, I would say that uh, the image from the, the building of the Temple of Solomon is quite uh, uh, intriguing in that sense, but it's not very common. This is not a very uh, uh, largely spread image of that. Um, but you point out a, 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 a distinction that is very interesting. It's between the, the different types of sound uh, and the difference between the voice and the noise. 
and between the human voice and things that are not human, uh, it can be uh, from uh, the animals, but also it comes in from the demon, for example. Uh, uh, Jean-Claude Schmitt in his last book showed that how the demons is what uh, uh, break the calm and quietness of the monastery, for example, uh, um, the, the fact of uh, yelling, the fact of screaming uh, are really uh, not a human sound, but something that is induced by the presence of the demon. So, uh, so there is a very strong classification of the types of sound and, um, and Susan Ranking really worked a lot on that, that and show how some animals make sounds that are closer to the human, so they can be, the, the sounds can be described by the quality of the voice, and others are making different sounds, so they don't have to have the property of the voice. And, but I would say that what the, the main difference is between what can be described as belonging to harmony and quite by not belonging to harmony. And all the sound that, uh, all the images here, as you can see, are representing explicitly the absence or the impossibility of harmonious sound, or something that you can describe as harmonious sound. The, the fact that noises, uh, the absence of noise are not represented is because image will tend to represent this harmony so if you avoid it in the image by itself, you already have an image of the uh, absence. And here, the work by Elena Gertzman of how, what sh should we consider as being absent or empty has to do with the property of the wall, the property of the, of the entirety. And this is how you will d discriminate between one thing and the other, whether should we avoid something that by definition should not be here. That's, that's really how, because if you, Avoid it, you make it be here. It's the principle of the uh, negative theology. It's the principle of negation in the end. Thank you so much. I don't see any other, ha no, no other hands, which I think is good because time is running and we have still a few appointments. I will just to make a precision, the family name of Pavla is Ticha, meaning silent. So I believe you should really discuss with her because she's the uh, embodied experience embodied of... <laughs> <laughs> of silence, so this is I important to say. Uh, so, if we have no other questions, I would say firstly, once more, thank you to Vincent so much. <laughs> Second, this was the last Stredovekina from the semester, and uh, we are expected to start again in February. So we have one month of break, and in February we'll start a new semester, and the program will be ready very soon. So, like, be really careful in looking what you are preparing, because it will be amazing as usual. I can anticipate to another embodied experience, namely Mindy Boy will speak, so this is something which is really important. Um, third point, uh, I'm obliged to do something I'm not totally how to say, convinced by it, but I will still do it. The center had decided after a long time of doubts and dramatical thinking and rethinking to open for an experimental three months stage an Instagram account. Uh, I can't say I am entirely on the part of the decision, but I am accepting the power of relative importance uh, by Jana and Rita who basically turn it in, in reality. So we are trying uh, something experimental and uh, we will see if this makes sense, really sense, which is not exactly having a lot of likes, but help people to go deeper into the reflection and in searching for what is really relevant to our world in medieval studies. So let's say if this will work, I have few doubts, but maybe I will convince of the contrary. Well, the third point, uh, the fourth one, is that I would like to rem just express my immense gratitude to the audience here in the room and to all people who are following us, because this was an incredible semester. We managed to do many things in presence, many things also through the web, and uh, I think this is precious to have people who are so interested in pre-modern visual culture to spend hours of their time following a center for early medieval studies, which is not exactly apparently the most appealing place to be in the world. So I would also like to say that this would never be possible without 
all our media team, you never see and the present are seeing. So namely Gaiane, Veronica helping, here we have Rita and obviously uh, the, 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 the Deus Ex Machina Anička who is in the shadow but she is the person who is making all it possible. So at the end of the year I think it's good to say thank you to all of you who are making it possible. And um, last but not the least, if someone of the present here would like to have presents for Christmas, there is our wonderful selection of books you can buy and for the absent in body but present in mind uh, remember you can become a member of our association of friends and you can also remember and i'm sorry this is so vulgar that you can also uh, what is the correct name i don't even know subscribe to our account on youtube making it here down so thank you so much to everybody and we will see each other next year